Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. If you've been following the channel for a while, you know I'm a huge fan of the Norlin era of Gibson because it birthed like limited edition guitars in the way that we think of them yet today. So like a special color or a kind of a gimmick, like take the 2550th anniversary Les Paul, for example. It was an anniversary. It had a coil split switch on it. You also had things like the Les Paul Artisan out there, but I've pretty well documented almost every single solid body guitar out of this era, except for one last big daddy and I finally got one. So have I saved the best one for last? I don't know because I always thought these were one of the strangest offerings by Gibson but they were also at the time of introduction the most expensive solid body ever made. And that model is known as the Gibson L5S. Let's take a look at this thing. Ah yeah that is just not as strange as I thought it was going to be. Like, I've been seeing these things on guitar hunting episodes, like in auctions all the time. I always thought, who would really even want one of these things? Because it's just like a freaky, weird, flattened Les Paul. But there's some dimensions to this thing that you don't really understand until you have one in your hands. I have actually seen two other of these in person, only briefly, like at the very beginning of my journey when I was buying a V Les Paul from another collector he had a couple of these and at that point in time i wasn't interested in something like this because i didn't fully understand it but today i hope i can educate you on this model and why you should pay attention to it maybe so this is a solid body version of the gibson l5 if you're not familiar with an l5 it looks like this it's pretty much the big Mac daddy of the Gibson arch tops in the jazz box world. Now sure, you got like Super 400s and other various high-end ones, but the L5 is like the cream of the crop. Everybody knows it. It's the top of the line. So this guitar was first birthed in 1972. It was released at the 1972 Summer NAMM show. And it looked a little bit different than this because there's actually two different versions of the L5S. The first couple of years of production actually utilized low impedance pickups. They've got the Gibson embossing on them. It's a metal cover this time instead of like on the Les Paul recording house, the plastic cover. So it looks a little bit different in that aspect. They've got those big rings around it. And that's how most of them looked from 1972, 73. And in 74, they started to convert them to humbucking pickups. So those are the two different versions to know about these. The humbucking version like we have here today and the low impedance. But from there, there's other deviations that make them different. So other than the pickups, you need to look at your tail pieces. You can find them like this that say L5S based off the L5's tail piece. This is a trapeze style one. There's not actually studs in the guitar. The reason why a lot of these have this is because this was meant to convert arch top guys into solid body electric guitars. Something a little bit more familiar as far as the cosmetic appearance goes. Like you've got the L5's headstock with the chalice or as it's better known as the flower pot. Super ultra bindings on here with abalone inlay. But later in the 70s, you can also find stop bar tailpiece ones when they introduced the TP6 tailpiece. So that's another two iterations you can find. But then there's one more thing that makes these things different. Some of these will have two piece tops, which are highly desirable. I'm sure there's probably at least one one piece top out there as well, which I was kind of curious if this was one because this is looking really nice. I am not seeing a center line, so I might have stumbled upon something really special because there's other things that are different about this one. But generally, you have two-piece tops and three-piece tops. Collectors are always after the two-piece top variations because they're a lot more rare. So if you're a collector that just wants, you know, one of everything, generally you're going to want to wait for a very nice two-piece top iteration. And naturally, I've been waiting for the very right two-piece top. The fact that I accidentally stumbled across a one-piece top just makes it even better. But what made these things so interesting, I mean, besides all the binding, we'll take a look at all this on the workbench. This is going to be kind of a longer video. These things have a carved maple top to them. And now that I have it in person, they actually kind of have this as a wedge shape. You know, think the Futura model, where it starts off thicker right here because they have so much to the maple top and all this binding. And then it gets slimmer down here, like it's hardly anything. So that's strange. But you've got the flame maple on the top, and then you've got it on the back. And oh my goodness, this is one piece back, one piece top. <laughs> that's really rare. 
But there's other things that make this one pretty special. First off, we have cream plastics. Generally, you'd only find black plastics, so that made it special. But look at this. This one even has a stinger. And if you want to know the story behind this one is it was actually at a heritage auction. But the guy who had purchased it got it for his son, and his son didn't end up really using it. He preferred the other guitar that he also bought him. So this was sold to me from that guy, but now that I'm looking at it, Okay, this definitely originally had the Clues and Seal Fast tuners, so I'm guessing this overspray on the back actually is not factory. But at least we do still have the serial number on here. L5S, it's a 1976, it's a decal style serial number. Interesting, so we'll have to see if the Stinger's factory, but right now I'm thinking somebody was just uh, using that to cover up the old seal fast. I was more so scared about a headstock break, but you know, you'd think Heritage Auctions would uh, disclose some of that stuff when it's pretty obvious if you know about guitars for things like that. That way people who sell these things later on, they can actually describe them properly. Okay, so let's learn a little bit more about the L5S now that we kind of know a little bit more about this one. So when I said it's the highest end solid body guitar of its time, how much did it cost brand new back in 72? It was $895, which might not sound like a lot today, but adjust that for inflation and you kind of start to see what we're dealing with here. While it was the most expensive one at its time of introduction, later on things like the Flying V2, the Les Paul Artist, the Les Paul did end up costing just a hair more than this one. But by the time it was officially discontinued in 83, the price had jumped all the way to $1,699, with steady price increases you know, ever since its introduction. The model was in production from 72 until about 1983, but production really started to cut off after 1980. I mean, there weren't that many of these things made anyways. From 73 to 79, there's only approximately 1,813 of these even shipped. Their best selling year was in 1974 when they shipped 555 of them. Nowadays on the used market, depending on what kind of pickup configuration you have, or stop bar versus that, one piece, two piece, or three piece top, these things will range anywhere between like 4,000 bucks for a beat up one, all the way up to 15,000 for a really, really nice one. Something kind of similar to this, but let me tell you, there are some explosive two piece tops out there. And you can find them in a whole bunch of different finishes. Like let's check a few of them out on the screen. Generally it's some sort of a burst, then there's kind of a darker burst. You can find natural ones. The antique naturals look really nice when they're spectacularly flamed. So, I mean, if you want one of every color and one in every configuration, it's going to take you a while to find one of every single one of these. But generally, most collectors, they'll just find like one really nice one because they think these things are kind of quirky and cool. But these do have a few famous users. Ronnie Wood is probably the most notable because he actually has his own signature that Gibson did as a custom shop reissue in the 2000s. Keith Richards has also used one of these, Pat Martino, Paul Simon. But I don't think there's actually anybody who is like, yeah, this is the only guitar I'm going to use. Because this guy and its little brother, the L6S, never really caught on despite artist endorsements that were paid for. If you need to learn more about the L6S, you can check out this video right here. They're not really the same at all. The L6S had Bill Lawrence electronics in it. It had like a veritone switch that you could select between the different positionings of the pickups, but they are of a similar body shape, flattened Les Paul. I mean, this is definitely a little bit more traditional in that aspect. So to learn a little bit more about the L5S here, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench, take an individual look at its parts and specs. And I guess this is kind of a review of Heritage Auctions to see how thorough are they with their instruments? Do they know what they're talking about? Well, after an hour and a half of polishing this thing up to be as beautiful as humanly possible, more bad news on this guy. Okay, so it was sold as all original by the auction house, right? So that's how the guy advertised it to me. Even the pickups have been replaced on this. We've got Seymour Duncan 59s in here, not only in the neck, but also in the bridge. That one's got blue lettering, and this one has red, likely for neck and bridge. So, man, I used to hold Heritage Auctions to high regard because I figured they had the most expert team out there verify all the guitars that they auction off. I mean, that's why you pay them the thousands of dollars in their fees to sell their stuff for you. And unfortunately, it's just surprise after surprise on this guitar. 
But let's be fair to Heritage Auctions. They didn't sell this to me, so it's possible that the guy who sold it to me made these modifications. But if we really zoom in here, you can see, yep, there's that non-fitting cover. Now, if you know to look for it, yeah, it's pretty obvious, but from far away, it looks pretty darn good. So yeah, this definitely came from the auction house like this, even though advertised as all original. There you go, you can see that exact same pickup cover. Now I've got an interesting story. So back on that NASCAR cafe guitar, I purchased this metal polishing cream and I had some fears that would that take the gold hardware off? So I tested it on this one and everything was okay. It just got rid of most of the blemishes on there and so that's looking okay. But then on this one, it took the gold off. So <laughs> I don't think I'll be using that on anything but it definitely shows you these are not the same pickup covers. If you've got cheap ones, you can wear the gold off real quick on that. So hey, if you've got a gold hardware guitar and you wanna take it off, that's one way you might be able to do that or to age your guitar. Since it's not the original pickup covers to this, and honestly these pickup covers aren't even good fits anyways. I don't care, that was just a good learning experience. I didn't dare try it on the tailpiece. But anyways, let's look inside here. There's not too much going on in these pickup routes. You can see a single channel that was drilled through there in order to get all the electronics through everything. And the bridge pickup's pretty much just the same. What's really interesting is this is just more of a satin matte finish. So it's likely just an overspray of the red didn't actually get the clear coat. Whereas this has the clear coat over top of it. But there's no fancy markings in here, unfortunately. While we've got that pickup out of the way, take a look at the edge of the fretboard right there. I love the curly cue that they've got down here. It just makes this so fancy. And you can see that's actually carved out of the wood. That's not just in the fretboard or anything. That's the neck too. And they did a pretty good job of hiding that seam line too. So normally I only document all original examples, so unfortunately we're still not going to know what these things sound like stock from the factory, but with Seymour Duncan 59s in it, it's 8.34k ohms in our bridge, and our neck position a little bit less at 8.31, middle position for fun should be around 4, yeah, 4.17. Controls on these are a little bit different though. So three-way toggle switch, that's normal, but your volumes are on this side and your tones are down here. However, I'm suspicious that these have been replaced because I think now we know for sure the plastics have definitely been replaced on this example if the pickups have been replaced because cream just didn't really happen and the stinger was added after the fact. But you've got your output jack right here. But now let's check out our bridge and tailpiece setup. So this is what the studs look like on a harmonica bridge. Very similar to a Nashville style, but instead of a thumb wheel, they just have a little larger spot right here. And then the problem with these things are people use all kinds of different screwdrivers and they chew them up and then it gets hard to move. So finding one that actually has good grip on both of them is a miraculous feat. But yeah. Big ol' harmonica bridge. Why did they do it? Because it gave them more intonation room and they build it as a fancier part. In between when I filmed the first part of this episode in the workbench segment, I re-looked up that conversation I had with that guy and he said most collectors prefer the L5S tailpiece version ones. And now that I have this in my hands, oh my goodness, this is nothing like any other tailpiece trapeze style that I've ever felt. It's very heavy. I mean, most of these that I feel, I mean, they're like just a paperweight, but this guy is a solid 234 grams, or for us, about half a pound. But this isn't like a tremolo system or anything. The ball end of the strings just secure in there, and then just acts as a tailpiece. But when I took this off, I was like, uh oh, what is that? Does somebody have a Bigsby on here or something? No. You know how sometimes there's pick guards on guitars that leave little dings? That's exactly what this is. So you can find tailpieces that just look like this, right? And they don't have this middle emblem. This started life as that. They just bolted this emblem onto it. And then it's those screws that left impressions onto the top. So if you wanted to take this and convert it to a stop bar tailpiece version, you're at least going to have those holes on it. As far as how the tailpiece secures to it, that middle one right there is where your strap button goes into. Then those two on the bottom, that's where screws go into to secure that to place. What's that other hole? I'm thinking it might have been for a ground wire, but I don't see a ground wire there. And that's not a crack in the binding, that's just an impression line from the tailpiece. But anyways, with that taken out, 1000% confirmed this is a fantastic one piece top so if you're wondering why i'm not like absolutely angry about this is 
I can restore this guitar. Nothing has been done that is irreversible besides the, the headstock stinger, but I kind of think that's cool. But yeah, despite changed parts and stuff, it's still a fantastic example to document. It just means I'll have to pick up a couple other one of these. Unfortunately, I can't call it quits on documenting humbuckered versions. So even though my pickups are non-original, I did get the bonus of it being a one-piece top, which is just uber rare. And hey, it's actually pretty nice looking too. Lots of movement now that I polished it up. But now I want to help you guys understand this guitar, because I've always seen it like this in photos. It just looks like a flattened pancake Les Paul. I want to help you understand this. It still has a carved top to it. As we were talking about earlier, it starts really thick and then it gets thinner, but you also have a curve to the body this way. Then it kind of flattens out before it curves down here. So I'm going to use the contour gauge to help show you this. So here's what we have directly in the middle of the instrument. It's probably better to look down here. So it kind of swerves up like a normal Les Paul top, but then it flattens out in the middle and then comes down again. So that's what I was talking about right here. But this part right here is really rounded. It falls off really quickly. You can see how the light just goes whoop. That's what that looks like on the contour gauge. And then let's be real, the thickness changes all over on this body. So we'll just have to take a few different measurements here. So at the very thickest part, right here by the neck, it's a full two inches, 2.03. So that's a full on Les Paul with a maple top type reading. But then right here by the side is 1.43. So we've lost a good half inch right there, a little bit more than that because of that contour. But then by the very edge, it's about 1.35 inches. So from here, all the way down here, you lose about three quarters of an inch. Like down here, it's almost 335 thin line style, but up here, it just turns into a full on Les Paul. What a strange guitar. When I get all the other parts on, we'll take a look at the binding, because that's the next thing that's kind of weird about this. Looking in here, normally you see mahogany, right? But this is not mahogany. Maybe that's why it looks so different. Remember how I was saying that finish looked weird? I think it's because this is a complete maple body guitar. I mean, it still looks to me like it has a maple top before they join onto the maple back. So maybe there's like a little splice of something else in the middle before they add on the back because the top and the back are pretty big here. So moving on from our beautiful maple body, let's get into our maple neck and the fretboard. We've got 22 frets on this one with abalone inlay, so that's different from Mother of Pearl that you normally find. So check out my Steve Howe The Les Paul review and demo, and you'll kind of see this is very similar stuff. That is a high-end spec for a guitar, and it's absolutely beautiful. You got some great figuring on this one with color changing at almost every single angle. On top of that, I use that metal polish on these frets, so they're just shining like mirrors. Trust me guys, try some of this on your frets. The only downside is it smells and it turns your fingers black while you play the guitar for a couple of times. But it's worth it for the effortless feel. But hey, how about this for fancy? Most Gibson fretboards are only ever single ply bound on the neck. But this has one, two, three, four, five layers. And the frets run over four of the layers, and then you just get a single fret nib over top of the edge. So it's not as cool as a Spotlight Special that gets the double colored fret nib, but it's still very fancy, very similar to a The Les Paul. But these are considerably cheaper than those. And this is a gorgeous ebony fretboard, but what I did find interesting, despite being a really high-end guitar, there's a few areas that actually have chips out of that ebony fretboard, which you'd think on a high-end guitar like this they wouldn't have done. I mean, it's possible that happened after the factory, but like there's another one right there. There's some stuff going on there. This has never been refretted as far as I can tell, but sometimes that will happen during a refret. As far as wear and tear goes, you can see just barely anywhere starting to start on these first couple of frets. It's good to go. Oh, and if you thought five ply binding along each side wasn't fancy enough, take a look at this. Your side binding is also three ply. So you got that one single black layer running along there. You don't really see that too often in Gibson's catalog, at least for solid body guitars. Besides just the fancy binding, these dot inlays on the side actually stand proud. Just a little bit like your nail can catch on them. So I'm not sure if that was supposed to be a feature so you can feel it or if the binding has just shrunk and then those have popped out. Yeah, I'm curious though, what's our scale length? Looks like the standard 24 and 3 quarters. Typical 12 inch radius. I've got a nut width of 1.7 inches. That increases to 2.07 by the 12th. 
First fret neck depth is skinny at 0.81 and 0.95 by the 12th. Here's that neck profile at the 1st fret and the 12th fret. Definitely pretty skinny up towards the nut, but then flattens out just a hair by the 12th. I mean, in comparison to the volute right there, it makes the neck look absolutely tiny. That is a very small flat neck here, but it does get a little bit more substance to it up here, but it stays a very similar neck profile. It almost does the exact opposite of what the body does, how that gets small and then it gets up here to get chunky. It goes chunky from here and then gets smaller up here. But now let's take a deep look at our headstock. So our truss rod on this one is perfectly fine. You can see through to your maple neck right there. Here's what our truss rod cover looks like. It says Custom L5. Then we've just got that beautiful flower pot inlay here done up in abalone, but this doesn't look like the normal stuff. So this might just be particularly not that great abalone. Here's where things get real fun. The back, awesome flame and grain here. And as far as that on the contour gauge, it just kind of looks like that. You can see it swoops up and does the same stuff as the front. But I've always wanted to take the pickup control cavity off because it's actually made out of the same wood as the top and back. Now, sometimes these aren't exact matches. This one looks like it might be from the exact same piece of wood. But look at that, you can take this off and have all that. <laughs> I saw a comment that said, I don't like guitars, I just like wood. And I would kind of agree with that. I mean, obviously I like guitars, but it introduced me to how beautiful wood could be. I'd never seen flame figuring or quilting until I learned about electric guitars. So I've always wanted like a staircase made out of really nice flame maple or something. But what I didn't realize about this is how thick it would be. I mean, look at that, it's like a wedge. And it makes sense when you look at it because the back also has that same curvature to it. So it's not a flat back like a Les Paul would be. It's got the same contours as the front. We'll grab that on the gauge here in a second. But you can kind of see what we're even talking about here in that cross section. So this literally has to be thick to even fit there. So it's not a normal cover in that aspect because it just seals off these electronics. And unfortunately, everything in here has been gutted. Those are brand new pots, 500K. I mean, yeah, it probably plays better this way, but this was such a collectible example that somebody destroyed. Now, thankfully, I can find original pots, put them in here. I can find original pickups and put them in here. By the way, the original pickups on these were the tarbacks. What I'm probably going to have to do for this is buy another one of these that's, you know, a little bit more player's grade, but still has good covers on the pickups. Take it from that to restore this because I'll have to find pots that date very close to the serial number. So anything 1976 or even early 77 would be considered correct. But yeah, if you're trying to verify yours off this video, those are not original pots. But this is what I wanted to see. So it looks like this right here might be the ending of the cap. And then there's like a middle piece of maple and then they put on the top as we were seeing earlier. And if we look around the edges, this one does not necessarily have any flamed figuring. So that lines up pretty well with my thinking that it has a maple core with maple on the top and sides. So the top and back are as thick as the binding shows right up here. I mean, that's some really thick binding. And it's not only one ply, they've got that same black layer like we saw on the neck right here, on top of the multi, 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 multi ply over here. So these are just such fancy ornate guitars that almost go too far over the top and go into gaudy territory. I know a lot of regular Les Paul guys, we see these and we're just like, well, what, what is all that? But it's fun to get one of these to document it to appreciate it better. So the body of this is probably just as thin as a regular like L6S. They just put the maple tops on it. Oh man, it all makes sense now. <laughs> this one's got some nicks and dings. You saw some finish checking over here, but I just really wanted to appreciate the binding job here. Cool. You also notice this thing is such a fancy boy. It gets a heel cap and that's three ply matches with the sides here. Now, as far as the condition of the back, I saw some sort of a, a blemish right here. I tried to use my scratch remover to get rid of it. This is either a strap that laid on it or some sort of like a sunscreen, a perfume, alcohol. That's what that normally looks like. So unfortunately, I was unsuccessful in getting that off, but you can only see that if you're really looking for it. Same thing down here. There's some 
buckle worming marks, but nothing too over the top. That's just a beautiful back. It's got the wood grain, it's got the flame. Now moving on to our neck, similar to this area, there's another area of that right here. You have to get it in the light just right to see it. And then there's a few nicks and dings, but this is a five piece maple neck. I'm not sure if that's walnut on this model or not, because I know there's some of them that they actually tie in mahogany, but let's go ahead and say it's maple walnut maple like it normally is in this era. But that's a really cool finish. I love that red into orange into yellow before you get to the black. That is a multi-piece neck with a whole bunch of flame figuring going on. And the edge of the neck is so dark red, it almost appears black when you're looking at it like that. And once we get over the giant hump of a volute on this thing, as is common, you just get your stinger. And once again, what they were doing is the original tuners, they look like this. They're called Gluson Seal Fasts. So those are giant tuners. Like it utilized probably this original hole in that one, but somebody wanted these fancy boy Grover Imperials, which I popped one off so we could see it. They're just really fancy tuners. They're worth a heck of a lot of money too. Well, vintage ones anyways. But whoever filled in the top screw holes, they did a great job. This was probably invisible when they did it. They just doweled them up and then refinished the back of the headstock in black in a stinger because A, it looks cool and B, it hit those holes. But as time went on, you got the witness lines. Now what's okay about this in my book is you could take these off, install original seal fast tuners if you can find them, and just drill them back into place and it's technically back to all original. Because these are also bushing tuners. It's not like the headstock had to get reamed out or anything or any additional holes put in. Just one had to be filled in. So I'm not too upset about that either, but we really, really need to blacklight this guitar just to see what else might have been done. Because if pickups have been swapped, tuners have been swapped, we have a refinished area right here. Who knows what else happened? Because I was noticing my worst fear over here is that there's a headstock break. And if you get it in the light, you can kind of see an area right here. I think that's just an overspray area. So hopefully there's no headstock break hiding, but that is our next step here. Let's get over to the black light. Okay, our top is looking pretty good here. What's really cool is you can see the shadow of the tailpiece. You could not see that in regular lighting, but you can see it here because of how much UV that this thing has absorbed. That's really cool, I like that. But okay, yeah, those knobs apparently are at least old and vintage correct. I was a little bit suspicious of those because they hadn't aged too much. I don't think I pointed out a couple of the dings on the top right there earlier. As far as these plastics, most likely replaced since everything else was too. The screws have also been replaced on here, but everything's looking okay on the top. Can't really see too much on the fretboard, but I'll show it to you anyways. I guess this really shows you just how shiny those frets are though. Normally you don't see those reflections. Little UFOs. Face of the headstock time. This looks the way I would expect to see. No issues. Now we look on into the back. I was really scared this might have been an overspray area because of how it went in there and here. And the fact that this looks darker in person, like it's aged more, that might have been oversprayed for some reason. Like maybe the binding cap came off and that's why we have that little area right here because this is glowing actually more so than the rest of the neck. That is a definite possibility. Binding caps fall off quite often. And you can see there's a little bit of a separation line right there, but I mean, that's very common on anything. But I think that's a good showing of that and that. So, yep, I'm pretty confident something's been sprayed there. Here you can see what I'm talking about in regular lighting, how that's more yellow than the rest of the binding. That tells you something's up. I mean, thankfully everything looks okay as far as the neck joint goes though. Now going along the neck, you can see there's definitely either area of wear right here or another overspray. They did say the nut was replaced, but it still had lacquer on the sides. So I'm guessing that was a touch up when they did that. Some finish checking has occurred around there. So now we look over here and this stinger was definitely put on a long time ago because I mean, it black lights just about the same as everything else. I am not personally seeing anything that looks like a break, crack, or repair though. So that was likely just tuner related would be my best guess. The heritage listing said the serial number was faint. And I guess at certain angles it is gone, but it's really easy to see it. L5S made in USA, 00, 
And then you got the rest of the digits that don't really matter. All you need for the decal serial number era is the 00, zero to tell you it was made in 1976. But the sides of the headstock are still red. So how do I feel about heritage auctions? I, I guess the reason why I'm so kind of dumbfounded about this one is this was not like hidden deep stuff. They literally just did not check it. It just took like either the owner's word that it was all original or whatnot, because I mean, just one look at this, I, I, I told you guys, I've got proof of that. Yeah, that's not right. That stinger's added because, you know, tuners. One quick look in the electronics cavity would have told them, no, that's not right. And even just bothering to look at that would be not right. I mean, I hope this is not indicative of what they always do for every guitar, and it's just one that slipped through the cracks. But my opinion of Heritage Auctions is definitely a little bit damaged at this point. Honestly, I think the reason why the his son did not like this guitar is A, the bottom strap button wasn't in because when Heritage shipped it, they took it out for protection. That's a good thing. But the frets were rusty and the strings were so decrepitly old. No wonder he didn't want to play this thing. I'd be curious if he would be interested in playing it now that it's all set up with some fresh strings and has blindingly shiny frets. But the last spec to capture is the weight. Eight pounds, 11.3 ounces on my scale. All right, let's go ahead, plug it in and Hear how it sounds with these pickups, I'm sorry, I, d I didn't know all that stuff was replaced, but hey, we need to document this cool one anyways. Alright, let's go ahead and run through the tones of this L5S. We just heard the neck pickup. Now let's hear that same thing with our middle position. Try it with the pick. I'm enjoying the tones out of this one. I mean, even though the pickups are replaced, this isn't what they would originally sound like. I mean, I imagine it to be a more of a jazzy guitar. So it definitely has those sweet tones within it if you know how to play jazz anyways. Now let's see if this thing can rock. <laughs>
Now that we know all about the Gibson L5S, this weird, obscure, maybe misunderstood model, what are my final thoughts on this thing? I have more respect for it than I did previously when I was just looking at photos of this strange beast. It's got a lot of interesting specs to it, from the big body here all the way down to the small end right here, to the giant looking binding that's on these things, to the multi-flamed piece necks, sometimes even multi-piece tops, to the really fancy abalone inlay. This is a really cool guitar. Was it great for my style of like rock type music? No, but these are not original pickups, so I'm not sure if the original ones would have fared better. Generally, you have like a 59 and a JB in here or something else a little bit hotter. So having two 59s, that's the first time I've ever had a guitar like that. I wasn't a big fan of the distorted tones out of this thing, but clean, yes, that, I mean, that's where it's at. Now, as far as standing with this thing and playing it, honestly, you don't even notice the body being different because it's just the big part that kind of rests up against you. The smaller part is just off to the the side right there. So it's comfortable on a strap. I did notice it was actually a little bit neck divey, believe it or not. However, this big maple top on the back and making this area the bigger part of the guitar kind of made it less comfortable to play like rock style music like this. However, when you're sitting down with this guitar, it's really comfy because you've got this bigger part right here. It rests against your body, feels natural. And then you have a little bit more movement with your hands. So I think if you're sitting down playing and being all jazzy, I think you're actually gonna be fine with this. But if you have to play standing up, maybe not the best guitar for that. I mean, they could have easily sculpted this away. They've got enough to do it, but then they would have had to have gotten rid of the binding. Just as an update on my whole fret polishing thing, that's just something new I'm looking at, but here you can really see just how shiny these frets are. It's ridiculous. After taking a microfiber cloth to it at the end and really going to town to get the black gunk off, this guitar did not turn my fingers colors like that last time I used it. So I think I'm slowly figuring out how to make these frets just fantastic. I mean, they feel great to play, especially for bends. They're just slinky, not even in your way, and they look fantastic. So I'm really glad I started to use that product. I would recommend it. It's a bit messy, but if you learn how to use it, the results are amazing. So would I document another one of these? Yeah, probably. For me personally, I would rather have one of the low impedance pickup versions because I know those things get jazzy. And imagine that with a solid body L5. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.